All right, everyone. Thank you all for joining me today. I am your man, Corp J. And I'm excited to be having this video with you all today. So let's get right into this because I want to talk about a lot of things. And this video is perhaps going to be a very, very insightful video for many of you. I want to give you updates on what's going on in Niger as it relates to the coup that occurred on the, uh, July 26th that ousted uh, Mohamed Basum, who is the democratically elected president uh, of Niger. And I want to talk to you guys about what has since occurred in that. But more importantly, I'm going to, I'm going to structure this video in, in three parts. First, I'm going to tell you why the coup that occurred in Niger, as well as one that happened in Burkina Faso, the one that happened in uh, Guinea, the one that happened in Mali, as well as Chad, these are not to be considered as coups. As a matter of fact, I will tell you why they are not to be considered as coups and why these ones, the deposing of these presidents that lived, that uh, once ruled in these countries, are far different from what we've known to be coups in Africa, West African region. I will tell you why that is and why also, because even while they have the making of that, of what we know as coups, they are not to be considered as coups, and that's why it bothers the West, the likes of the United States, France. I'm going to give you that insight. And then I'm going to tell you why this is a great time for Africa and why this period in time is going to be seared in history as a moment in history that, that shifted political affilia affiliation, geopolitical affiliation, geopolitical relationships in Africa, in West African countries. And why this is going to reshape a whole lot of that, that may very well present Africa and structure Africa differently economically on the world stage. And then lastly, I'm going to tell you why the war on terrorism, the so-called war on terrorism, which the West mostly uses to really muzzle its forces against many countries, primarily in Africa, why that has been used as an exploitative strategy to gain or steal Africa's resources. It has a lot to do with that and less to do with the so-called fighting terrorism around the world. I'm going to tell you why that has been used as a strategy and why countries like Nigeria, most in particularly, should really watch out. Because if you are from Nigeria, you, are, you want to listen to what I'm going to tell you. Ghana also and many other countries in neighboring countries. You want to hear what I got to say about this. Okay, let's get into this because, as you can see, we've got quite a lot, and I want to get right into it. Okay, so why I don't believe the this situation that happened in Niger should not be considered or be measured up against uh, with the other coups that have happened in uh, in West African country or Africa as a, as a continent. The reason why is because when you look at the coups that have occurred in Africa, West Africa, over the years. There have been over about 250 plus coups that have happened, and of which about 106 of those have been successful. Almost all of these coups that have happened in Africa over the last 50 to 60 years have mostly been backed by the West. See, France, United States, and England have had their hands in destabilizing regions. That is a strategy they use in destabilizing regions in Africa. It's almost it's, it's a strategy they use to oust a president or an administration, or a head of state, who they fall out of favor with. So they back militia groups, they back you know, insurgency, they back a lot of you know, uh, mercenaries who infiltrate military camps, and then oust these presidents, who either at one point dance to the tune of the West and decide that, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore, we're good. So once they fall out of favor with those people, they've used coups like this to depose those presidents. So it's, it's, it's replacing one corrupt leader who they've corrupted in many cases with another corrupt regime. That's what we've seen play itself over and over and again in Africa. So there's always been in most in all cases of the coups that have occurred in the last 50 to 60 years in Africa since most of the African countries gained their independence in the mid-1950s in the mid, uh, or in 1950, 1960s, I should say. Those coups have all been backed by the West. Now, which is why I say this is different, because what we're seeing in Niger recently and also what we've seen 
in the last four to five years with the coups that have occurred in all the other neighboring regions, how are in, these coups are an indictment against the West. See, that's the difference. Okay, so you're not seeing this is not something that the West is backing any military industrial complex in any of these countries and say, hey, let's pay you up and I want you to go ahead and oust these president. No, it is an indictment. It is a pushing back against Western influence and against the same people that have been exploiting their region for years. So what you're seeing in the Sahel is these countries now standing up in one voice and saying that no more. Are we going to allow puppet presidents in our countries? Keeps stealing our resources and, you know, uh, allowing you to exploit our countries of resources that we are supposed to use to gain or benefit our people. So when you have people like in Niger, countries like Niger, who is one of the 10 poorest countries in Africa, rich in uranium, which France uses to power its nuclear plant and also give energy to its country. You have countries like Niger, who also is rich in gold and diamond, which France and the French people exploit and enjoy the benefit of that. You have the citizens of those countries impoverished. You have Burkina Faso, rich in gold, and you have you know, France having kids Mining in those gold mines, in many cases, most kids die, suffer, have diseases. Because when these countries like France and many of the Western countries come and exploit these African countries, they're not doing it, adhering to all the environmental procedures in those areas. They pollute the, the land. They, they infest the place with chemical biohazard. They pollute the water. They pollute the land. They cause a lot of earthquake, a lot of the civil, a lot of the... Uh, uh, natural disturbances in the land. They leave the place in ruins. They don't care. But they will never do the same thing in their own country. See, in their own countries, when you go to the West, it's all about energy re renewability, clean gas, clean air. They do all and adhere to all of that. They have organizations that make sure that you're not polluting the water. You're not causing uh, pollution into the air. They have all of that. They don't do that in those African countries. They leave it in ruins. Because why? They paid off some African head of states to allow them to do all of this. So you're finding Burkina Faso, Mali, and all of that saying enough is enough. And we're not going to no longer allow you to do this. So this is an indictment against the West. This is why this is different. I won't call this a coup, even though it has the making of it. I would actually call it the people's military takeover. Because for the first time, we're seeing the military industrial complex of these countries fighting for their own people now and saying that no more, enough is enough. You, won't, you can no longer keep exploiting us at the expense of our people. Our people are dying because these people have to live in these countries. Our people are dying. We're suffering. Our nations are deteriorating. We no longer can have a standby and allow this happen. And they're pushing against the West. This is making the West very nervous. And so they're so, they're so nervous now that they, they're looking to do something about it. Because France has, of course, its interest over there. Because France has been exploiting Africa. It won't be good for France. It really wouldn't. See, France has been a, a, a parasite, like many other Af uh, Western countries. France has been a parasite against and mutual off of the once colonized countries in West Africa. They've been eating off their resources. See, France will not be France today, as I mentioned in my past video, without Africa. As a matter of fact, I'm not the only one saying it. Former presidents of France have made this uh, 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 declaration. They've also said this. Okay, Jacques Chirac, who was the former president of France, says, without Africa, France will slide into a third world power. His predecessor also said the same thing, that without West Africa, France will not even be mentioned or have any position in the 21st century. So they know this. Most people know that with, without Africa, France and many other Western countries will not have a position or have any place in society today, which is why France has been mooching off and exploiting West African countries. See, a lot of Western countries know fully well the position and the resources that the Western, that the African continent is endowed with. Rather than going there as a, the, in the right way, rather than going there and say, hey, let's partner and have mutual benefits, let's mutually trade. You know, we, you have something we want, you may have something we, we uh, you, you have something we want, you may have something you want. Right? Let's let's see how we can partner. No, they don't do that. They go in and exploit. They go in and corrupt leaders. 
and take it by force. And if anyone in Africa, by the way, listen to this. If anyone in Africa dares to challenge their position and say, hey, no, 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 no. This deal doesn't work for us. This is not how we're going to do it. They, will have, they, they usually would either assassinate those Africans, impose sanctions on those territories, and bankrupt those countries. It's a bully tactics that the, that the West have always done. Now, France is not the only one. You have the United States in Niger. Now, you want to ask me a question. And the question is, what is the United States doing in Niger? I can understand what France is doing there because these are once French colonies, countries that were once colonized by France. But what is the United States doing in, in Niger? As a matter of fact, most people didn't realize that we were in Niger. The United States was in, it was, it is in Niger. The United States has forces, military forces, at the border of Niger, Tongo Tongo. And I'm going to, talk, I'm going to discuss that a little bit later on. Now, Here's why the U.S. is there. <laughs> Let me give you a little snippet. Because this whole thing is, it stinks, right? Here's what's going on. Now, after the, after the uh, Mohammed Bazoum was deposed, shortly after that, we had uh, the Economic Community of West African State, ECOWAS, uh, which is an organization made up of 15 countries, of which Nigeria is the head of ECOWAS. Give these military coup leaders an ultimatum. And the ultimatum was uh, you have seven days to restore Muhammad Basum back to his rightful position or you face military intervention. Okay, so that's what happened. And the seven days was given to them, which expired, has since expired on August 6th. Now, what do you think happened? The coup leaders in Niger told ECOWAS to go to hell. Right to put it lightly, told them to go to hell. They dug their foot, uh, their their heels in the sand, and they said, "We're not going to because what you think this is is not what it is." See, you think this, you think we're playing here. You think this is a joke, right? You think we're going to just keep, keep sitting by and letting France exploit our country and keep keep uh, exploiting our land they, like they've done over the years? We're not doing this. For, for fame and money. We're doing this for the survival of our country. We're not going anywhere. Right? This is what they told ECOWAS. In many words. And now on top of that. You had Mali. And Burkina Faso. Who have also experienced coups. And done this. They did the same thing previous years. Stand with Niger and say we're standing with you. Now. <laughs> now this is interesting now. Because ECOWAS didn't realize. That they were going to face the type of opposition. That they got. And the world was watching to see, when I mean the world, I'm talking about the West. I'm talking about the likes of the United States, France, England, those ones that have been mooching off of these territories for years. They were watching to see if ECOWAS threats and their intervention was going to amount to something. Of course, now they saw African countries staying together, which is a fascinating thing to see. You know, say whatever you want to say about these countries that have had coups. They stood together against ECOWAS and said, hey, it is not your fight. Stay away from this. And I will agree. Stay away from this. We are fighting against, We are fighting for the survival of our countries. We're fighting for the justice for our people. We're fighting France, who has been exploiting us for their own gains. Stay away from this. Because if you don't, we're going to stand together in which they all publicly came out. And we're going to fight you on this. Now, that won't benefit anything. Now, that act of defiance weakened ECOWAS' position. And now ECOWAS has now resorted to, let's, okay, let's talk with each other. So that is something that is different. Now, shortly after that happened, country, uh, United States, seeing this defiance on the part of these cool leaders, now wanting to protect their own st stake in that region, sends their warmonger, Victoria Nuland, who is the uh, acting deputy secretary of states for the United States, sends her the next day to Niger to go do the same old thing that they've always done to uh, African leaders. There were there have been accounts that she went there to try to bribe these coup leaders because that's what the West does. I mentioned earlier on the West has been involved in all the coups that have happened in Africa. They've used it as a strategy to oust presidents. To fatten the, the, the pocket of some few corrupt people who they corrupt so they can keep business as usual. 
Now, the, why is why is she there? Why why is why is the United States sending? Uh, why are they involved in this? You know why? Because the United States gets seventeen percent of uranium also from Niger. United States has military personnel in Niger. There are over there are almost about thirteen hundred military personnel in Niger. Why? Because they they have an interest there. <laughs> they're, they're, they're <laughs> God, <laughs> they've got an interest in Niger, just like France. So they waited to watch what ECOWAS did. They waited to see. And once they saw that that didn't go anywhere, they sent this warmonger, Victoria Newland, over there to try to bribe these guys. And guess what she found when she went over there? She was snubbed. Because these cool leaders are not, they, they didn't take over the government the way many of the other coups have happened, which is why I said this is different, have done in the past. They're fighting for their own country. So no amount of bribery by the West is going to amount to anything, which is why she was snubbed when she went over there. The coup leaders of, uh, are making a statement that we're no longer going to deal with the West. It hasn't worked. The alliance and the partnership with the West has not worked for Africa. It has done nothing to, uh, to improve Africa, to elevate Africa. It's done more to destroy and exploit and rob Africa of its gain and leave Africa more poor than they met it. And so now you're finding a new strategy, a new political alliance is taking place. Say, so we don't want to deal with you anymore. We want you to be gone. So when she went over there, she got snubbed. She never met with any of the cool leaders. She met with just petty officers who just basically blew her off. She went away with her tails between her legs. That was an indication that this is different from what they've been used to, that these cool leaders are not playing. So now they're pressuring ECOWAS to fight a proxy war for them. They are pressuring ECOWAS and the countries in ECOWAS that, make, that form ECOWAS to do their dirty deals for them. Now, here's where ECOWAS will really need to take a position. Here's where ECOWAS will really need to decide <clears throat> which part of history they're going to be part of. Because right now, ECOWAS is on the wrong side of history here. Because even the countries in, that make up ECOWAS have not benefited from their relationship with the West. There's no one in their right mind today that would say that the West, the partnership that the West has had with Africa has benefited Africa as a continent or the countries in Africa. It has not. It has not. When you're finding African citizens leave their countries and go to places in the West, they're not doing it because they enjoy living in the West or want to somehow, no, they're doing it because the West has, has exploited a lot of their countries, exploited their land, stolen from their land, left their lands and their government in ruins. And so now these people are going to those countries to say, hey, if you're going to steal from my country, so maybe I come to your country and tap into those resources that you won't let us in our countries develop in our countries. You won't let our leaders alone. And when I mean leaders, there have been leaders that have tried to fight off the West from stealing from their resources. These leaders have been met with assassination. As I mentioned, the West will back insurgencies, militia groups to oust leaders who oppose them. So what is Africa to do? Ask yourself, what is Africa to do? If Africa is saying, Let's leave us alone to fund for ourselves, leave us alone so we can build our countries up, and the West is saying, well, we're not going to because we need your stuff. We need these resources. We need all of this. And guess what? If you're going to deny us this, we're going to destabilize your region. We're going to sanction you. We're going to make sure that it's impossible for you to trade with neighboring countries. What is Africa to do? So Africa is forming new alliances. Africa is saying, you know what? We're cutting our ties with the West, and we're going to form new political alliances, which is why you're seeing the conversation with China and Russia taking roof. You're seeing conversation with China and Russia being embraced. Now, Africa has a right to, make, to, to, to partner with anyone they want to partner. If the West has a problem with, with Russia and China, doesn't mean that Africa should have a problem with, Iraq, with the Russia and China. If the West has a history with Russia and China, that, is same, that history isn't the same with Africa. Africa has a right to partner with wherever. These are sovereign nations. They can do whatever they want. The idea that the West tells Africa you can't partner with these two because we see them as enemy, that is what you call dictatorship. That is what you call fascism. Okay, your fight is your fight. 
Now you're finding even in the likes of the United States, pressure on African leaders and African countries like ECOWAS to back the war in Ukraine against Russia. You're finding Newland, Victoria Newland, this same woman, going all over the place. She goes to South Africa and pressures the, the president over there. She goes to uh, you know, Nigeria. She goes to Ghana. She goes to Kenya. She is pressuring all of these countries to back the war in Ukraine against Russia. What's Africa got to do with the war in Ukraine against Russia? What does Africa got to do with all of that? See, that is that arrogance of the West to tell a sovereign nation, to tell countries in Africa what to do. And it hasn't really worked. And so you have African countries now re rethinking their alliances and their partnership. And they're now entertaining partnership with other countries and other nations like China and Russia. Now, why are they entertaining this? Because unlike the West and the United States, who dictate to countries, giant countries in Africa, and tell them, we will we'll tell you what to do. Don't think. We'll tell you how to think. Unlike that type of relationship, China comes in and says, hold on. Let's sit together at the table. Let's reason together. Let's see how we can mutually benefit from our workings together. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that type of relationship as much healthier than the one that tells you and beats you upside your head and tell you, you're going to do what I tell you to do, otherwise I'm going to destroy you. So that's a slave. See, the West is being, they're used to having black people as slaves and they think that we're still in the slave era. So that's that mindset, right? And you're having, that, you're having a different conversation here. So Africa is realizing that, look, this is a better relationship. Let me, let, me, let me nurture this relationship here because this one right here is toxic. You have Russia wiping out the debt of seven African countries and say, hey, no questions asked. Let me wipe your debt out so that way you don't have to start, in, you don't have to start from a negative play position and you can start building from that. Now, if you are a leader or a citizen of those countries, you would see that as a, as a positive response. Something to really look into. So the West and their issues with these countries have nothing to do with Africa. Africa has the right to think for itself, to stand on its own, to make decisions for itself that benefits those regions and benefits its citizens and its territories. Which is why you're seeing those alliances. And you're having Burkina Faso, the leader of Burkina Faso, whom you really need to watch out for him because he is an impressive leader who is now taking the spirit of Thomas Sankara and really perpetuating the vision to move his country forward. Now, those countries in West Africa are now saying enough is enough, which is why I think ECOWAS is on the wrong side of this. Because if ECOWAS can really show and prove, which they can't, that the alliances in the West have really helped their own countries, which is not, they're on the wrong side of this. And ECOWAS will really need to we really need to uh, ask itself, what position do you want history to remember you by? Because the position ECOWAS is doing right now is lit literally dancing to the will of the West while going against their brothers and sisters war and oppression. Okay. So let's talk about the so-called war in the so-called war against terrorism. Let me tell you why that has been used to rob Africa and exploit from Africa. You see, the war on terrorists or terrorism started and that whole war and the term the war on terrorism was something that we first in the West, at least in the United States, got aware of during the Bush administration. So the Bush administration during the time um, came up with these, what has now been known as a bogus, bogus uh, uh, claim that Iraq at the time, Saddam Hussein, had weapon of mass destruction, uh, destruction, WMDs. And because of that claim, which has now been known as a false claim, they went into the war on terrorism because according to uh, uh, President Bush at the time, we need to fight them there so they don't, come to, they don't come here. That was how he put it. We need to take care of these terrorists, so-called terrorists, in that area so they don't fly here and attack us. And he said that shortly after the World Trade Center was demolished or was attacked in the United States, which then spawned the over 20-year war which the United States just got out of that went from Iraq all the way to Afghanistan and so on and so forth. 
That's how we got the war on terrorism that started off. That whole ideology and that whole strategy has moved and expanded to where we've seen it now used in Africa. For example, Libya. It was the same thing that was used in Libya. Let me give you, let me, let me show you some few things here. Because I want to tell you that, there, I want to show you how this was used to destroy Libya. Muammar Gaddafi was, uh, was killed uh, because of this. And how it has had now is cascading effect on neighboring countries that have caused the type of civil unrest that we're seeing even in Sudan right now, what we're seeing in Sudan. Let me tell you why this was used as a geopolitical strategy to siphon off the resources in this area. Let me show you something real quickly. Okay. So here's, the, here's the, uh, a map of West Africa. And a lot of the activities that we're seeing going on today are uh, occurring in this Sahel region. So we're seeing things like, of course, in Niger, we're seeing the, uh, the, uh, civil, the unrest that occurred. We know about the one that happened in Mali, Burkina Faso, Chad. These are all in the Sahel. These are all in West African country. Now, Libya, who in 2011 went through a devastation after the killing of Muammar Gaddafi. Muammar Gaddafi was a leader who was loved by his people. Of course, you wouldn't know it if you lived in the West because of the propaganda that was put out there against this man. Muammar Gaddafi was a man who was trying to unite Africa as a continent by creating a monetary system that would give Africa its own currency and cut Africa off of the Western dominance or the currency like the, uh, the euro or the dollar or even the uh, CFA for France. Muammar Gaddafi was going to establish a a unity in Africa where Africans can kind of move around sort of the thing that the AU right now, African U, uh, Union is doing right now. He wanted to make Africa strong. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with his vision for Africa? Right? But the West didn't like him for it. Because essentially it cuts all their dependence on all our resources in those countries. It cuts them off. It makes Africa stand on its own. It gives Africa a an economic strength. It gives Africa also a military strength where Africa can defend itself and its borders if they need to. What's wrong with that? Of course, they didn't like him for it. So they created a propaganda around him using and paying militia groups and insurgency that the West backed to kill Muammar Gaddafi. Now, where is Libya today? Libya is in devastation. So you have terrorist organizations that have infiltrated Libya right now. Libya, which was once a thriving country where men and women, if you're married in, in Libya, it was a thing in Libya. If you were married, you got free accommodation in Libya. You went to school for free in Libya. Women were respected in Libya to the point that even Muammar Gaddafi's military troop had women in that. They had pipelines that had water pipelines, oil pipelines. He was building schools for his people. This man was doing things that we wish most African leaders would do for their own people. They didn't like him because he was being a self-sufficient leader. Someone respected. They took him out. And then what happened is that you immediately saw the deterioration of Libya to where a lot of terrorist groups, Al-Qaeda, the Daesh group, began to infiltrate Libya. And once Libya got destroyed, they moved down south of Libya. So you found these terrorist group moving south of it, which is what I think, if you're a military strategist, and if you are looking to gain the and exploit these regions of their resources, and you're using the war on terrorists as a ploy to do it, taking Gaddafi was a smart move on the part of those type of thinking, because it drove a lot of these insurgencies and groups into neighboring countries. They're now going to those countries and begin to become a problem in those countries. So Mali began to see the rise of these groups in their countries, in their country. You see Niger, you see Chad, you see Burkina Faso. Sudan is having a huge problem right here. They're having a huge civil unrest because of these going on. And now that's what the United States and France uses as a ploy to say, hey, let's have our military troops in those countries, right, to help you fight against these terrorists. This is how they bring their military presence in those areas. 
That's why presidents that once were a part of, that once ruled Mali, Burkina Faso, danced to the tune of the Western influence because they come in and say, hey, our satellite picked out these terrorist organization, right, in these areas. We need to come in and deal with it. In exchange, we'll train your people, right? This is a so-called training. If you believe that the West will really train your military uh, personnel, really, but this is what they use. We'll train them. But while we're doing that, uh, let us uh, also tap into some of your resources as an exchange because we're providing you military training so you can combat this terrorist organization. You wouldn't want your country to be known as a terrorist breeding ground now, would you? That wouldn't be good for international and, and investment to your country. So these are the things they present to these foreign leaders, for, foreign uh, these head of states, who then have to now agree to terms that really put their own countries in such devastation. So you have military French military presence in Mali who have since left Mali due to the coup that happened there. You have the one in Burkina Faso who have since left due to the coup that occurred there because these countries finally got a wind of this BS that these European countries, France and the United States, use to exploit their land. So Niger now is the most recent one. So you have 1,500 French troops in Niger some of which came from Mali because they were, they were kicked out of Mali and Burkina Faso. So they all went to, Fran to Niger now to make sure that they uh, protect the French interest in that, which is uranium in this, in this whole case. You also have United States, which is why Newland went over there. She, U.S. got about uh, over almost 1,300 troops. U.S. troops are there. Why? Because U.S. also depends on 17% of uranium from Niger. So they're going there with the same bogus stuff. We'll go in there, help you to fight this terrorist group that we're seeing through our satellites radar and help you curb them. But in addition, while we're doing that, we just need some of your uranium. Okay? So that's what that's what happens. And they use this whole thing as a ploy to do this. Knowing fully well, they created the terrorist organization by destabilizing regions within those countries. Knowing fully well that what was going to happen. So now, guess where? Guess what's going on? If you are in Nigeria, you got to be thinking about this also. If you are in Ghana, you got to be thinking, because these things move south, right? So now you've seen Niger pushing back and saying, we're done with this. But they have terrorist organization lingering in their area. You have Nigeria with Boko Haram that has been there for years. You have the girls in Chibok that were kidnapped a couple of years ago in 2014. You have these types of issues going on because the West created this. And now, so, if you're in Nigeria, you also need to be asking the question, what, what deal has your, your government signed with the West? Because you're soon going to find military presence at the border of Nigeria for the same BS reasons that you found in all these other countries. So that's why most people are asking, is Nigeria, Ghana, and many of the neighboring countries going to be next? Because Nigeria is the most powerful country in West Africa. Nigeria is a target for the United States. See, the United States, he's in, uh, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me put you on some game. United States sees the influence Nigerians and many Nigerians are having all over the world. Well, if you believe and understand the nature of the West over the years against black people over the years, it's not to see any black person strong, competent, rise or be such a force to reckon with see nigerians are a threat to a lot of western people because nigerians in addition to the fact that the nigerian people are strong nigerian people historically for years of thousands of years have always been a resilient people they're smart they're all over the world making strides making things happen that is something that is a that's a concern for a particular people in a group of a group of people in a particular part of the world who have always hated the dominance or the, 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 the strength of black people anywhere in the world. And so this, I'm telling you right now, that if you're a Nigerian, you need to see this as a threat against your own people and your own region. Because I think this whole thing is a, a ploy to destabilize Nigeria. See, Nigeria is going to be once, it's going to, not so long from now, they're going to label Nigeria as a terrorist breeding ground. When Nigeria has never been there. Now, you, of course, you have you have the the presence of these groups 
Boko Haram in Nigeria, and they'll be moving south from other neighboring countries up north, moving downwards, because that is what, if you're a military strategy and you are destroying and destabilizing areas, you naturally will predict where they're going to move. And you know this, and you probably force them in that corner, you force them into that position, you pay certain insurgencies to, to guide them through that because you're looking for resources. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? And Nigeria, is, Nigeria, like Niger, has a lot of resources, which the West has been stealing for years. And so my concern is that what we're seeing in Niger is something that we need to also predict could possibly happen. And I'm hoping not. In Nigeria, in Ghana, in Benin, Cote d'Ivoire. These countries right here are at risk of the type of thing that we're seeing in Niger occur. And most people will look at it as an insurgency in those countries that the military people are taking over because they see it as a coup. But what you don't see are the strings behind that that are making this happen just to destabilize your region. So that way they can then get the resources for cheap and for scraps. Okay, so that's a lot, and that's heavy, right? However, these are my own uh, my own uh, analysis, but I want to hear what you have to say about this. I want to hear what your thought is. Do you agree with my analysis? And do you see the handwriting on the wall? Do you see where this is going? And do you also agree with me that? What we've seen in Burkina Faso, Niger, and also in Chad, as well as in Mali. This is the time that Africa is taking back their own land and saying enough is enough with this. Now, Africa's got a lot of work to do because Africa will need to deal with the, the rise of terrorist groups in, the, in, their, in their homeland, which obviously have been created not by them, but by most of the forces in the West who are look, have used that to exploit Africa. Africa's got a lot of work to do, but it would do it banding together and not fighting against each other. See, ECOWAS standing against these countries in Africa is the wrong side of history. Because I, I agree that in the West cannot keep stealing from Africa or keep exploiting Africa and think that Africa will not fight back. Africa is fighting back and they're forming a new political alliance. But they've got a lot of work to do because of the mess that predecessors have done and connived with the West to create a lot of the mess that they have right now. But they're doing it, and they've begun the, the battle. And I think it's left for us to watch and see and also support good moral causes to uplift Africa and make Africa again a giant in the region. Thank you all for watching. Please like the video, share the content, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you all next time. If you sing in an under, so can store up by my side, oh why? Set it to rap, put it for me, or for the baby. For them, hey, y'all, this, y'all, this. Don't be your bother, and it rocks. Men do a fat of only. But they are legged, I'm in tears. You will hardly, hardly, hardly. Information, I saved it.